Hello, everyone, and welcome to the high-level plenary on solutions for decarbonizing the built environment. My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based in Brussels, uh, senior writer for energymonitor.ai, and I will be guiding us through today's conversation, uh, where we're going to be talking about something that is really critical to the energy transformation, but it's also not so well known among the public. It's not the first thing that most people think of when they think about what generates emissions. So according to the International Energy Agency, cities are responsible for over 70% of the world's annual carbon emissions. Based on the world urbanization prospects of the United Nations, it's projected that by 2050, approximately 68% of the global population will reside in urban areas, primarily in developing countries and transitioning economies. This rapid urbanization is expected to trigger a substantial surge in energy consumption and accompanying greenhouse gas emissions. The growth will be driven not only by the construction of new buildings and infrastructure, but also by their ongoing operation. So the emissions come from the construction of the infrastructure and then also the use of the infrastructure for decades. Now, the buildings and construction sector in particular contributes to 37% of energy-related CO2 emissions. And current construction practices rely heavily on energy-intensive materials like steel and cement. With urbanization trends, there's a significant demand for materials to support the construction of necessary infrastructure. Approximately 5 billion square meters of new floor space are added each year, which is equivalent to constructing an entire city the size of Paris every week. So, how do we take action to mitigate the impacts of the built environment on our global environment, on the environment that we live in, on the atmosphere? It's essential to protect, to prevent and reduce the underlying causes of climate change and its associated impacts. In this high-level plenary, we're going to explore the importance of decarbonizing the manufacturing and construction sector, uh, and we're particularly going to be looking at how we decarbonize these essential materials that are used so much right now, like steel, cement, and concrete. We'll also examine the state of progress in the decarbonization of these sectors, the critical actions needed right now to get to where we need to go in order to meet the Paris Agreement goals, and we'll also discuss the financing needs, particularly for the Global South, and what's needed to unlock the millions needed to remain within the carbon budget. We're going to start off with a keynote speech from Mathilde Mesnard, who is Deputy Director, Deputy Director for the Environment and Directorate at the OECD and Coordinator for Climate and Green Finance at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. She supervises work on climate and green finance and investment, as well as on environmental and economic integration. And also from 2016 to 22, 2022, she was Deputy Director of the OECD's Directorate for Financial and Enterprise prize affairs. Mathilde? Dear ministers, dear colleagues, it's really my pleasure to be here today to discuss about this, this really fundamental issue. Uh, let's go back to climate change first. It's really uh, one of the most pressing and complex uh, policy challenge of our times. It's, it's a kind of a truism to say that, but I think we are, we are really facing it every day, and especially when we are talking about industry decarbonization. Uh, effective measures to reduce greenhouse gas emissions require both domestic and international action and cooperation. And to be on a net zero emission pathway, decarbonizing emissions intensive sectors like steel, cement, glass is critical, not easy, but urgent. These sectors are essential to our way of life. They supply the materials needed for construction of houses, of factories, of offices, and other commercial buildings. They are also used for developing infrastructures, such as railways, 
uh, highways, ports, etc. So really they are the key engines or the backbone, as one of our colleagues said in a recent discussion, backbone to the production of trade and production and trade of goods and services. So to our economic growth and more broadly to improve the lives of the people across the world. And over the past two decades, the global population has grown by 25% to more than 8 billion uh, people. And GDP has doubled to US uh, 100 trillion. In addition, we had rapid urbanization, especially in emerging and developing economies. And this has driven a massive increase in the demand of new material supply. This led to an increased demand for materials produced by heavy industry by about 110% for steel and 140% for cement, for example. And the climate impacts of the production of these materials and of the sectors they are used in are massive. The production of steel and cement alone is responsible for around 16% of the total global emission of carbon dioxide. And buildings and constructions account for as much as 40% of the total CO2 emissions. So really, it is a massive impact in terms of uh, climate change. Decarbonizing the industrial sectors that produce materials for the built environment relies on the set of low carbon options, energy efficiency first, renewable energy, low emission fuels like hydrogen, carbon capture, and circular economy altogether. But there remain challenges for achieving substantial emissions reductions that would be consistent with a net zero emission pathway. And I will categorize these challenges as follows. First, many of these low carbon options are still at early stages of commercialization. And that means that they are still more expensive than conventional or traditional practices. And this creates risk, of course, for financiers and investors. Second, the manufacturing industry is exposed to trade and global competition. So higher costs for green materials are particularly problematic because they can be easily substitutable, substituted with cheaper and polluting alternatives. Third, the industrial assets for steel and cement production have long lives. That means that every investment decision made today for a conventional production route means that emissions will be locked in for the coming decades. And this, of course, exacerbates the risk of stranded assets, and this could eventually be more costly than investing today in low emissions technologies. So as governments, private sector actors, financiers, and international organizations, we need to act on these challenges and act now. It's really our responsibility to turn climate ambition into concrete decarbonization actions. And today, today's panel includes high-level speakers from governments, from industry associations and financial institutions who will discuss how to overcome these challenges and many others. As at the OECD in the Environment Directorate, we support industry decarbonization, particularly through our work on financing. And our work is focused on improving access to finance and financing conditions for emerging and developing countries. And this is particularly critical because it's where you have a significant share of the global material production, and it's where also new industrial materials are most needed to provide infrastructure and the services required for development. So, and this issue of like finding, having access to finance is, is one of the main obstacles. Private sources of capital will be needed to supply the largest share of the financing needed for a green built environment. Of course, you have the public concessional finance, but it is limited anyhow. So we need to mobilize better and to mobilize more private capital, unlock it for industry decarbonization. This is really crucial. So our work points to several ways forward to make this happen. First, the direct, the direct public support and concessional finance has a key role to play. The different types of concessional finance, be it guarantee, um, uh, grants, uh, etc., 
and there are, they should be used particularly to support the first movers for strategic technologies and for projects. But then you need blended finance structures that can help lower the cost of finance across the project life cycle. And you need de-risking instruments in particular to support the early stage technologies with limited track record or with higher risk profiles. One very important element of like unlocking financing is to have multi-stakeholder approaches to structure, to design, to implement, and to coordinate de-risking and financing facilities. And to make these facilities successful, what is also critical is to have uh, policymakers providing a long-term vision and outline industrial plans through the development of national and sectoral decarbonization roadmaps. We have discussed that in a previous uh, uh, session this morning, and uh, some of the speakers said that we have enough strategies now, we have trust strategies everywhere, but probably we don't have enough sectoral uh, country-led uh, decarbonization roadmaps. And last but not least, in international organizations like the OECD, for example, have also a role to play to collect data from the real projects and consolidate the learnings, building evidence-based analysis to inform the policymakers and the financial institutions with these learnings. In addition, the OECD, together with the IEA, the International Energy Agency, we are hosting the interim secretariat of the newly established Climate Club, which will be formally launched at the COP next month, and which is a kind of a high ambition intergovernmental forum with a focus on industry decarbonization that does three things. First, that works on climate change mitigation policies, looking in particular at, at uh, carbon intensity issues, methodologies and data, and carbon linkages issues that work on industry decarbonization, different industries, and is building up a matchmaking platform that will gather the governments and the, the, the providers of capacity building, uh, technical assistance, and the providers of financing to try to make the projects happen. Um, we are working on this matchmaking platform with the UNIDO and the IEA, and we hope that by the end of next year, there will be action there, and we will really uh, concretely help things happen. So um, before I end my intervention, I'd like to underline that, again, that decarbonize, decarbonizing sorry, the industry sector is both possible unnecessary, but quite difficult. It requires better enabling conditions and the right financing instruments. So that's easy to say, but really difficult and complex to put in place. And this is even more critical, of course, in emerging and developing economies. Uh, but there is an opportunity to play a leading role both in delivering ambitious climate action and economic development, but by leapfrogging really to cleaner production routes. So as a conclusion, I'd like to congratulate UNIDO for organizing this week's forum. And I wish you all a fruitful discussion on this critical topic of industry decarbonization. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Mathilde. Uh, it's particularly important the point you made about these being global sectors and subject to global competition. I think that's a, a theme we'll talk about on the panel, and we'll come to you toward the end to get some, some final thoughts. I'd like to introduce now to you our panelists. So here on my right, we have Thomas Guillaume, who is uh, Chief Executive of the Global Cement and Concrete Association, the GCCA. He has over 20 years of sustainability experience on circularity and industrial ecology in both operational and functional roles. He led the GCCA is development of Holson's decarbonization program and its circular businesses, sorry, before GCCA, uh, uh, which was called GeoCycle. Uh, and at GCCA, he leads the Global Net Zero Implementation Program. So welcome, Tomas. Then we have Luis Tinio, 
who is interim CEO of Climate Investment Funds. Luis is a World Bank Group veteran. He has over 25 years of experience in developing and implementing large programs, partnerships, and country engagements with the World Bank. And finally, we have Kirsten Dunlop, who's CEO of Climate Kick, Climate KIC, uh, which is part of the European Institute of Innovation and Technology. Uh, she's been there since 2017. Uh, and prior to that, she had roles in Second Road, KPMG, and Suncorp in Australia, also working in the UK and Italy for 15 years in financial services, consulting, and academia. And she can tell us a little bit more about the EIC, EIT and uh, Climate Kick as well. So thank you all for joining us today. Let me start out with um, a general question for all of you. We just heard from Mathilde there that the, 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 tr the tricky thing is the technology is there, right, to decarbonize these things. There's all this innovative technology. The problem is it's expensive. And these are sectors that are exposed to global competition. Uh, so Tomas, how how can we incentivize the private sector to invest in technology innovation that supports decarbonizing these industries even if it's more expensive a lot of the time? What are the main gaps constraining those investments? Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, maybe first I, um, I, I want to give a few um, um, numbers or, or perspective on, on concrete and say why and explain why uh, it's particularly relevant to illustrate the discussion between North and South. Um, concrete material, concrete is uh, used, uh, I mean, we say it's one of the most used material of the world, uh, backbone of modern society, all this, but it's 80% used and consume uh, in the global South, only 20% in the North. Uh, and that's important because all the discussion uh, we, we have on this, on, on decarbonizing that material, needs to take into consideration that the decarbonization, the decarbonization needs to happen uh, in these countries as well. It's not enough to have uh, a great framework in, uh, in Europe with uh, innovation uh, support, with uh, EU ETS, or, or in USA now with IRA. We need also to contemplate that this type of, of model, this type of support needs to happen actually in, in over economy. And yes, there is China that has a big role in that, and we know that Chinese are active and, and they are working on that, but we also know that the Chinese, the weight of Chinese in construction will reduce, and that will be transferred on, 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 on India or Africa will pick up, so it's, it's particularly important. Um, so what, what can we do? I mean, you, you said it, and I, I think there is um, a, a few words that have been said in, uh, by Mathilde which were important, and I, I, will, I will start with the, the notion of de-risking. Uh, I was in, um, in the New York Climate Week uh, some, uh, some time ago, uh, and there I met a lot of people telling me, uh, oh, we have a lot of money, we have billions, I'm, I'm a head of, of a 1 billion, 2 billion, 10 billion fund, etc. A lot of people came to me and said, we want to invest in, in, uh, in decarbonization solution. What do we do? Right? And then we discuss, but what you realize is that they are ready to invest, but they are not ready to invest at a loss. Right? And, 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 and they, they want to have return on investment, sometimes even higher return on investment because it's a risky, uh, you know, risky geographies, risky whatever. And the question is, how do you convince these people that actually it's time to move and that this is actually an investable proposition, so to say? So what can we do there? And I think there, there is a really important role of uh, the government, changing, changing the model. We have, we have to change the business model and we have to move from a carbonated product to a decarbonated product. How do we do that? By changing the rule of the game. Uh, few notions. One, uh, demand signals, procurement. Uh, the states in many parts of the world, they are um, uh, guiding uh, about 50 to 70% of the consumptions of building material um, product solutions in general, uh, by rules, by regulation, by issuing permits, uh, by defining the norms, the standard, by making themselves uh, personal order when they build infrastructure, etc. So having a, a vision on, look, uh, we will favor in this procurement discussion not only the economical part of the discussion, but also the uh, ecological part of the discussion, having in place a model that first explains what is a green, what is a low carbon concrete because that's also a problem. Every, everybody calls ca low carbon concrete something. So, um, and later on, favor and say, well, when the technology is available, we will go only for near zero uh, technology. 
that's already a very strong signal to uh, investors to say, well, there will be a market uh, for this product. The work that we have been doing, and I'm saying that uh, with um, uh, even more pleasure because we are in a, in, in a Unido uh, event, but the work we did with IDDI is really instrumental in actually shaping on giving um, a rule, a grid, a, a, a reading map for this type of, um, of, of discussion. Um, I, I want to, to give another few things on, um, uh, again, going beyond the, the procurement, but also in, in shaping the regulation itself. I mean, uh, we have different technologies to decarbonize concrete. One of them is the circularity, right? Circularity works even in developing countries. It's not necessarily about recycling business, recycling building here, but it's using waste uh, as a source of, of uh, material, as a source of energy to produce the material. In uh, um, Austria, uh, almost 100% of the, uh, close to 100% of the, of the uh, energy need to, to do concrete, to do cement, is actually coming from the waste, thanks to a very strong regulatory framework, right? Uh, uh, you cannot build a circular economy model if you do not have at one moment somebody that stays, a government that says, well, stop, we will not anymore landfill uh, plastic or energetic material, this is banned, and we will enforce that regulation. If you don't have that, things do not happen. It will always be cheaper to open a pit, put the, the dirt, or, or I have some other words coming to my brain, <laughs> I should not say, uh, in, in the hole, cover it. That's the cheapest solution, right? But if you want to do something with it on favor of circular, you need to have a network. This is valid for carbon as well. We need to give carbon a price. And that's really a discussion that needs to take place. And there are some uh, very interesting uh, um, panel or, or format of discussion, in particular the Canadians uh, have launched uh, together with the World Bank uh, what they call the Carbon Pricing Challenge, where they actually uh, convene countries to participate and to discuss how do you uh, uh, put in place a framework that gives carbon a price. And we have to remind carbon give a price to carbon and avoid carbon leakage. I think that was also something that Mathilde said. We have to avoid that then the, 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 the dirty material, dirty, uh, the carbonated material comes in the country in place of the local production. That's not the, the wish. So these are, these are fundamental parts. And these are elements that countries have to shape and have to develop in order to favor and to create the condition for these technologies to emerge. Luis, how would you say that we can encourage innovation in these innovative technologies that can decarbonize the built environment? I can, I can see Thomas' uh, point. Let me take a, a little bigger uh, scope, because I think that uh, Mathilde outlined the uh, three things. And I feel like the CIF, the Climate Investment Fund, provide, you know, the, or filled an important role here. The first thing is that Thomas is outlining situations in markets that in developing countries do not exist. So you need to create the market first. So you need to put together the enabling environment, and that is the package of investment uh, plans and you know, long-term strategies, etc. Second, you need to put the incentives. The incentives for lowering uh, barriers for accessing finance to unlock essentially the private sector. It's in the private sector where you find the clues to solve uh, many of these issues of industry decarbonization, but I would add the connection of the, the growing cities. If you, if you put all this discussion into, into one context, I would say that it's in the 15 fastest growing cities in the world. Almost all of them are in the developing world, where markets, again, do not exist. Access to finance is very expensive. Institutions are still figuring out you know, how to put together the sequence of policies, investments, et cetera. The CIF plays an important role there because the CIF brings concessional finance precisely to, to take, uh, you know, to, to uh, buy down, you know, not only the cost of financing, but also by us absorbing the, the risks of uh, creating those markets or de-risking those markets. For that, the model works with, you know, the incentives of putting together the multilateral development banks at work. If you see what we have done, and the CIF has been in business for 15 years, essentially our track record is super strong in over the 70 countries, most likely in clean energy technologies and energy efficiency. Now we are volunteering 
to go beyond this. And, and of course, industry and cities is the next frontier for an outfit like the, like the, like the SIF. If you think about the, the, the issue in developing countries, you cannot ask developing countries to go in the, in the path of, uh, say, low, uh, net zero and, you know, and uh, low carbon development and all that at significant uh, uh, debt uh, rates. So you need to bring that uh, into control. And for that, concessional you know, is, is a key. The CIF brings uh, those at a ratio of, say, $1 that the CIF uh, puts in concessional finance it mobilizes about uh, 9 to $10 in multilateral uh, development banks' uh, finance. That then tackles you know, or provides incentives for what Thomas is saying in the case of cement, uh, you know, and steel. And, and you, you can name, you can keep going because you know, you, the, the fast-growing cities are needing pretty much everything including all kinds of metals and all kinds of uh, technology. So if you think about the CIF as the, the largest pool of uh, concessional financing, and you operate with this model that has been proven uh, valuable and, and, and successful, then, then now you need to put more into, into it. Instead of diverting or you know, going in different, you, you need to invest more in this, in this type of outfits. And I don't claim that the CIF is the only one, but for sure over the past 15 years, the CIF has proven you know, quite an instrumental element in the climate finance architecture. And of course, you know, in the in the in the interest of supporting countries in their long-term strategies for decarbonization uh, and, and resilience development. Kirsten, you're really focused on the innovation side here. How do we, you know, there's, there's these great technologies being developed, this great innovation going on. How do we get people to actually invest in it and deploy it? Well. Um, let me maybe give a very concrete example, which is very live at the moment. It's not a Global South example, it's a Global North example. Um, and that is what is happening in Europe in the context of the Green Deal, and specifically what Europe has done to launch missions, so a mission-led innovation approach. Um, and with respect to cities, that is the European mission on 100 plus climate neutral and smart cities achieved by 2030. So that's an initiative that has 112 cities committed, 100 in Europe and 12 on the edges of Europe, to decarbonize by 2030, not through offsets, but through innovations implemented in the real economy in those cities. It's a big mixture. It's cities that are large, Paris, Amsterdam, Madrid, Rome, and it's cities that are mid-size and cities that are small. Um, the reason why I'm speaking to this is that Climate Kick is the organization that orchestrates a platform funded by the European Commission to make this happen, which is made up of a number of very different actors who are actually seeking to solve exactly this problem. How do you mobilize investment? How do you mobilize innovations? And most importantly, how do you leverage what's there but is not integrated and combined to make that order of structural transformation possible in seven years, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, so a few reflections on this because I then think it builds very much on what you're both saying uh, and very much on your sense of the, of the call to action, Matilda. Um, the way this works, so think of this as a petri dish because if Europe pulls this off, it sends a very significant precedent signal. And the idea is not that we wait until 2030 but that the process of learning how to do this and doing it now builds example, helps front runners really move and shifts a very strong directional signal. So first of all, the fact that it is a mission-led logic very much speaks to this idea of long-term stability and enabling conditions. This is about a directional signal to markets across the whole of Europe and any industry embedded in global supply chains that trade in Europe where cities are the market-making context because this is where the biggest demand, the biggest procurement comes for, the biggest long-term planning and materials, um, logistics, supply chain, you name it. Um, that translates into three concrete elements that are part of this initiative. One of them is an investment plan, which then looks at the economics of, if I take an example of Madrid, um, this is an investment plan that needs um, 3.5 billion per year for the next years 
in order to be able to get to a decarbonized outcome with something like a 32% return on investment. So it's not an uninteresting economic case, but it requires some really interesting blending, precisely to your point, of very different financial mechanisms that currently don't play together. But it is an economic plan, an investment plan, and a trajectory for action. It's combined with a climate action plan, which means looking at baselines, looking at what the emissions obstacles enablers, the materials are, and it comes with um, a governance innovation plan, because this is possible with multi-level governance and with an agile mechanism for allow allowing communities, districts, residents, local councils, the city government, the regional government, the national government, and the pan-European level to play together. Um, in the case of, for example, uh, Spain, one of the things the Spanish government has chosen to do is mirror this mission initiative nationally so that there is a greater market signal in terms of procurement and take up. Um, it requires a significant shift in terms of information architecture, data collection. Um, but what happens is that you, and we are seeing that already, uh, the commission has translated this initiative into labels. So cities have now received, the leading cities have received a climate city label. That's something that they can then take to industry and take to market. And one of our efforts, in fact, is to bring in the big heavy emitting industries, cement, steel, glass, plastics, and so on, and look at between now and 2030, what is needed in terms of supply? Who's ready with that order of supply? The answer to which currently is no one. Um, and how do we begin to layer in? Uh, and it, I think to come to your question on how do you get people to invest, some of it is about the very steady directional signal. Some of it is about beginning to bring in counterfactual risk. We are only just beginning to see the signals of value destruction coming, but it's coming anybody invested in the internal combustion engine or any part of its supply chain in Europe is currently overpriced because we haven't actually priced in the implications of a legislation that says that's out of the market. You start adding in this degree of change of decarbonization in construction, building materials, logistics, transport, energy infrastructure, energy integration into that much, it's 12% of Europe's population. Any business touching those value chains needs to rethink its pricing. So then there's a different conversation about, so how would you get into not the value destruction that might be coming down the pipe faster than you think, but the beginnings of market creation, early stage procurement, structuring, early stage permitting, thinking about securitization of future value of land where properties are being decarbonized, thinking about how to release and look at differential lending and pricing rates for businesses, councils, communities that are investing early and changing their regulation and planning laws, thinking about insurance mechanisms that start to reserve for prevention and start to reserve early or incentivize adoption, changed materials, and thinking about how we combine long-term patient capital, for example, that has the capacity to invest in municipal infrastructure on electrification of transport because it can take infrastructure and assets, and combine that then with um, project finance and mezzanine structures for the preparation of many elements, but you need something stable, strong, and at scale to create that kind of market pull through. And that's really what this is about. It's a market building exercise to speed up innovation from being small scale startups to large scale deployments, district by district. And that I think gives, uh, certainly gives me a lot of hope for hanging in there because it starts to make this very, very real and very practical. It's really, about a, it's really about a change in mindset, too. Um, Thomas, let's, talk, let's zero in on the Global South. Um, what do you see as being most needed by the cement industry in the Global South to implement deep decarbonization technology? What are some of the innovation opportunities, and then what are the challenges? Yeah, I mean, uh, in innovation goes beyond um, uh, Global South. So, I mean, I, if, if I talk about innovation, I really take it in a in the sector. Maybe I, I take the point of innovation first and then we talk about the, the, the global self and what can we do to unlock this, this discussion there. Um, on innovation, I think that this works pretty well. I mean, we are probably acting in the, in the first steps of the innovation in, uh, in, uh, in, in our industry. And um, I, I like to say that because our industry does not particularly have an image of, of super innovative industry, right? I mean, it's a little bit great, it's a little bit <laughs> old school. But um, we have put in place in, um, in, in the GCCA uh, two, uh, I think, really great uh, uh, innovation platform, global innovation platform. The first one is called uh, the GCC 
RN Research Network. And that's a partnership basically with um, 45 of the most eminent university uh, talking about building materials uh, science uh, over the world. I mean, from South Africa to US to uh, Asia, China, etc. And with that, we have a cooperation between industrials uh, and um, um, uh, academics on making basic research to actually really advance the decarbonization discussion. And today, we have about 75 PhDs uh, working on whatever it is different, uh, a very, very focused decarbonization themes uh, from artificial intelligence to material science, the use of whatever molecule, polymers, or whatever you name it, uh, into, the, into the system on, on to make it advance. Uh, and, and you, it's piloted between academics on, on, the, on, on, the, on, on, the, on business. So these are really a view of you know, how will we then implement this quickly into the system. Very interesting. Uh, the second one is what we call open challenge, and there it's um, uh, basically a, a startup accelerator. So what we do every year, we launch a challenge. Last year it was about new molecules, new materials uh, to contribute to uh, a net zero concrete. Uh, and, and we have actually received uh, more than 100 startups working on the, on the themes, and we have selected 15 of them to actually meet the industry uh, and, and see whether you know, we could actually uh, try to prove the technology. So it's really about getting the, the technologies that is developed by the, by the startup further. They, they have in, in the theory of startup, they call it the valley of death. This, uh, you, know, this, you have this TRL system, it's a bit complicated. But, and, and you quickly accelerate the moment where you say, OK, I have something which is great in lab, but I need to test it in, uh, in situ, in, in industrial. We are accelerating that moment so that Technology is making uh, uh, itself through, and on, on, on we have some, some great uh, result in that. So that's for uh, innovation, and that's how we build. And then these, these technologies can then be moved uh, uh, upscale or further with, with, your, with your model uh, being pushed through the, through the public. Now, uh, on, um, on, uh, on Global South, and I think this is um, uh, a very uh, important themes. I mean, we have, and I borrowed the concept that was, uh, again, I heard it for the first time in, uh, in, uh, in Unido, uh, what, what, what they call, what is called here, the chain reaction. And I, li I like it because it's very much about, it's very basic, it's very simple. First thing is, do your homework. Us industry, we need to have everywhere in the world, in all geographies, within all uh, cement uh, uh, actors, uh, players on the market, a clear understanding of how we're going to play the technologies that goes to decarbonization. They are in our roadmap global seven technologies. We need to understand how do you play these technologies in South Africa, in Thailand, in India, etc. On, on, on the intensity of these are not the same necessarily. They vary from country to country, from situation, etc. So that's really the, the, the first thing. But while doing that, you need also to understand how do I relate to my government to uh, create these famous enabling conditions. So circularity, how far can I go? Uh, are they ready to follow on a waste legislation, yes or no? Um, what can I do for, to develop the carbon management when we talk about carbon, uh, carbon capture, use on store? Uh, uh, on on products, I have an issue with standard. Can my government help me to accelerate the transformation of the standard so that the low carbon product can uh, uh, fit their place, find their place uh, uh, on, on the market? So that's really important, and that's the second stage. It's really the, the, the famous enabling conditions. In the meantime, you also work in parallel to say, okay, project. What do I do? Uh, and for me, there is two nature of projects. The first one is about uh, the more the strategizing type of project. So again, uh, carbon management, how shall I develop my pipeline of infrastructure? Where will I store? What is the, the big themes of scheme that, that you know, will, will enable these technologies to actually find its way and to develop in a, in a smart way on a, on a given geography? And of course, the second part of the, of the project are assets asset development, right? And this also needs to find its way, and that's the first step, the third step of the uh, um, uh, chain reaction, is working with uh, multilateral development, working with organizations like the one you name, or with the CIF, to say, okay, let's prove that these things being, though being a little bit new, let's prove how this works, and let's demonstrate that you have actually an investable proposition through that model. And multilateral bank, CIF, will help us. I mean, you said one to 10 uh, uh, in terms of leverage of, of money to actually put these things forward and to demonstrate that the first mover advantage have indeed an advantage on average something, including in Global South, including in India. We are working in very concrete, concrete cases in India on, uh, on carbon capture. So okay, how do we finance that? How do we pay for it, right? And then when you have seen that, then you can actually go to, the, to these guys in New York that tells me I have a billion to invest in, uh, in, uh, in, in Global South in, uh, in decarbonization and show them and say, guys, look, that's the way. 
and the smart one will go first, and that's how the chain will deploy, and that's how, how, that, how, that's how we will go, and we'll get to the, um, to the actually global rollout on this acceleration that we see uh, after 2030 uh, on all these technologies. So, we're sticking, sticking with the global south. Um, how does CIF support countries in the global south in industrial decarbonization, and what's the importance of concessional financing in unlocking investments and capital for industrial decarbonization? I, I think that we are speaking kind of like in a, in a quite uh, consistent sequencing. The CIF target is developing countries, right? And that's where we think that uh, the business opportunities for, you know, technology developers, you know, and, uh, and introducing new technologies will happen in the future. This morning, uh, in the opening, when the, the moderator was foreseeing the 2050, of course, you know, this is what we are talking about. In, in 2050, you will see the Sao Paulo, you will see the Mexico cities, you will see the Jakarta, you will see, you know, these cities driving a lot of, the, of development. Now, what, what's, the, what's the issue that you face in, in, in the South? that they have bigger trade-offs. One is energy access, for example, against you know, servicing the needs of industry for growth, what I was saying about cities. So that, that is probably a trade-off that the city of Madrid is not facing. So you need to, ta to, to tackle both. And both require concessional financing, because at the end of the day, whether you are talking about energy access through clean technology, or else, say, you know, uh, advancing technologies for decarbonizing cement uh, and, and other <clears throat> industries of the like. No matter what you look at, you know, you still are uh, seeing, you know, the treasury of these countries unable to provide the financing that is required. The CIF is proposing two programs the industry decarbonization program, the, the smart cities program, the two go hand in hand. And if, we, if, if the model that I explain upon which you know, the CIF has proven a, a solid track record, good experience, dialogues, et cetera, by bringing this uh, programmatic approach that you also outlined, say, for the city of, uh, of Madrid, or Mathilde was outlining at the outset, as, you know, tools required to advance uh, decarbonization, no matter what uh, sector you are looking at, then, then, then that's how, how it clicks. Because now, now you are not only unlocking financing, you are working at the upstream part, bringing assurances to the markets that, you know, there is stability, predictability in the, in the financing, predictability in the policy and the business environment, and downstream by bringing, you know, the de-risking elements that come along uh, with, uh, with concessional fines. That's what we are proposing for the, for the South. There is no other way that uh, you can solve the climate crisis of the future if you don't you know, put an effort and a focus on, on, on these countries. The CIF is outlining a strategy for these two programs. And as I said at the, at the beginning, targeting, say, the, the 15 top uh, fastest growing cities is a good idea. Building upon the investment plans that we already have in more than, you know, over 70 countries makes sense because it's modular, right? You, you are adding more pieces. We are talking about uh, decarbonizing in a, in a mitigation uh, way. But let's not forget that there is an adaptation side of, the, of this. Similarly, you know, if you are talking about, you know, industry decarbonization is because you are building the, new, the cities of the future who should, which should be resilient and they need to, 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 to use, you know, the, the best technologies precisely, not only to, to, to mitigate or reduce uh, emissions, but also to be resilient, stronger, and so on and so forth. So uh, urban planning needs to integrate these things risk uh, reduction, not only financially, but also, you know, to natural disasters and all this needs to be integrated. The CIF is, is putting these packages together. We hope to launch these two programs uh, very soon. 
And I would say that, uh, say, if we are capable of raising, say, for industry, $300 million, we are capable of mobilizing two, $3 billion in this, uh, for this uh, environment. And let's see if we can then try your solutions uh, right there. Kristen, it sounds like part of the struggle here is about visibility to really where these um, innovations can go. What do you think could be the path-breaking innovations that bring a larger visibility on decarbonization in these heavy industries? Well, so I'm going to answer that question. I want to do one really quick thank you for bringing in something which is very closely related, which is this piece on adaptation um, and resilience, because it's very connected then to the path-breaking uh, innovations. One of the things I am most worried about when I look at the work that is happening in cities is the assumption that the technologies that we're using and the ways in which we're applying those, those technologies and materials, construction, everything, is going to be an extended present of our current climactic conditions. And every single time we have a conversation, it says, have you designed this tarmac, cement, steel, glass, structures for violent storms, heat of 50 degrees plus, etc.? Nobody's thinking about it. So it is deeply worrying, and I really would love to triple emphasize that matters. I think the other element, if we're talking about cities in the global south, which is also relevant for the global north, it's just the global north hasn't realized what's happening, coming, is informal cities. We cannot only talk about cities as if they're formal settlements. We must be talking about cities as formal and deeply, widely growing informal settlements and think about what is the urban design, spatial energy planning, spatial planning for cities that are composed of both and accept that we're going to be dealing with more UN cities for a long couple of decades than we're going to be dealing with structured cities. Because we're an overshoot. We are not going to be holding to 1.5 degrees with the best will in the world. So one of the things that I then am going to come back to this question on breakthrough technologies is the biggest innovation challenge is designing for the integration of what we have now and the scaling at system, kind of scaling the combination of things to the point where we get actually new alternative ways of living and alternative ways of expecting to live. And that also needs to design for the extent to which we need resilience, not just in climate change, uh, weather condition changes, but in social instability changes because we're dealing with contexts where the breakdown of social order as food and water systems start to come under extreme stress and energy systems come under extreme stress is imminent or is at least very predictable. So this comes then to some of the breakthrough technologies because it means we need to shift our thinking from is hydrogen the answer to energy? It's an answer. One of the biggest problems is it's stuck in a particular a set of ideologies around how energy should be done instead of possibly being used to address some of the less exciting but immediate needs on storage where we could be doing a hell of a lot more faster instead of romanticizing the idea that we're going to have a set of hydrogen solutions on XYZ. Um, another is geothermal. We know that geothermal has enormous untapped potential. What we haven't really addressed yet is how we think about getting the scale right. So modular geothermal, which is now beginning to be very possible, it's a form of energy democracy that's literally put a pipe down in a house and bring up heat from the Earth's core. You don't have to drill very fast and you've already got very far and you've already got enough to run energy. But of course, if we do it that way in panic, then one of the things that we lose is the value of load diversification across multiple systems. So then it's really about thinking about how do we devolve energy to communities and districts and do spatial urban planning that is therefore deeply community designed, community owned, community structured. So you're getting into something that shifts from the individual technology to the real breakthrough in innovation is how do you design the combination, the use, the scaling, the right sizing of technologies to meet with governance, community structuring, ownership, usefulness, utility, and resiliency where we need to, for example, have redundant energy supply or we need to be able to suddenly um, deal with fluctuations. I think the other major area where we know there's a huge possibility and where the Global South will lead the world is in biomimicry, green chemistry, nature-based solutions, 
And in the global north, one of the things we're going to desperately need is those solutions for historic buildings where we have not the resources to intervene into big, extraordinary, take, take the Hofburg, extraordinary expensive interventions. We're working on the assumption that we heat this volume of air or we cool this volume of air. We're going to have to start thinking about nanomaterials, cladding, surfaces that heat and cool, including our clothing, including buildings, because we don't have the materials to do the kind of structural changes that we need. So there are, there are shifts in technology that are not obvious. They are more about paradigm shifts. And I think actually the, the, the technology that matters the most is the human capacity to learn and relearn how do we expect to live. How do we learn to live with less resources, with more efficient requirements, materials, energy, with much more creative and deeply intertwined relationships with nature in historic buildings, in developments, in informal settlements? That's the very front edge of innovation that we need to work on, transformation of ourselves. Yeah, the most, the most important technology is our own brains. I like that. Um, let me check if there's any questions from the audience. Uh, do we have anyone with a question? Yes, right here at the front. Uh, I'm not sure if we have a microphone. Is this gentleman here? Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Axel. I'm from Latin America. I'm the youth representative for CIFROL at this program. And my question is for Kristen. Uh, I know you was participating at the Innovation Lab Summit in Colombia this year. So this guide me to the next question. Uh, what strategies or initiative is Climate Kick implementing to engage with and support Latin American markets in their efforts to address climate change? And how do you see these efforts contributing to the global fight against climate change? Do you think youth is playing, youth is playing an important role in this? Can you ask me that? Do I think what plays an important role? What? Do I think what plays an important role? Um, Your well, last question. Uh, can I repeat? What strategies or initiative is Climate Kick implementing to engage with? Thank you. Uh, yes, I was in Colombia in May, and uh, absolutely fascinating. Actually, one of the things that I really, really noticed and felt is that in Colombia, in every sentence discussing climate action, peace action is in the same sentence. And one of the things that really struck me is the capacity and the willingness to acknowledge, for good reasons, the relationship between social stability and, and justice and well-being and our actions in climate and climate transformation. Super important. So um, to your question in Latin America, uh, Climate Kick uh, is an organization that was created in Europe by the European Commission. It's an independent structure. It operates in 60 countries and it works in Colombia, for example, and in Brazil, in other South American, Latin American countries. What we currently do is innovation incubation, acceleration, and innovation ecosystem building. So essentially building a capacity on the ground for solutions development, incubation, deployment, and acceleration. Um, I think that's incredibly important, and there are a lot of learnings from the last 13, 15 years in Europe in constructing effectively a field of climate innovation that didn't exist in, in 2009 when Climate Kick was created. But it also worries me, uh, if, I'm, if I'm honest, around the way in which the divide between the global north and the south is still patterning out in a request for an approach to innovation that I would consider 20 years old and out of date. I still focusing on the development of individual solutions, single point solutions, still looking at an investment in entrepreneurial journeys that then seek financing, whether it's concessional or venture capital, and still fragmented, therefore, and perpetuating a deep fragmentation. So I think the next challenge for us, in fact, we are just publishing a strategy now for what we do for the next seven years, is to start really lifting up and pushing hard for deeply interrelated industry, SME, individual entrepreneurs, government policy, institutional finance, to be working actively in partnership so that we build the sustainable markets of the future because we, will, we are absolutely going to totally depend on the biodiversity richness, on the reserves of nature, natural preserves, wisdom, materials, understanding resources, oxygen, um, carbon dioxide absorption, and the social wisdom that comes with it. So it, I think there's a, there's a next generation of learning about building a field of climate action which is deeply focused on poverty, inequality, justice, 
integrated industrial development that is sustainable, circular, regenerative, and is making the best possible use of nature-based solutions. And that, for us, is the next frontier. So where the, but my, I consider to be the biggest challenge is how to rise above the horribly polarized divisions and discussions between global north, global south, how to do more to support south to south, how to do much more to lean into genuinely uh, collaborative partnerships, not relationships that are still fundamentally about extractive economies shifting their shit to the global south. Well, before we wrap up, I want to get some final thoughts from Mathilde. Based on what we've heard here in this discussion, what would you say you've heard that seems like the most important things we should be focusing on right now, 2023, lead up to the COP28, um, as we're hearing from representatives from the industry, from finance, what stuck, what stuck out to you? I think I was very uh, struck by the idea of, okay, we need to, to build a sense of stability and, and direction. It's not only stability because we need definitely instability somewhere, you know, a sense of direction, and that is for the OECD and for governmental or intergovernmental organization. We need to build up this enabling environment. So it, it's not new, it's not a scoop, but it's, it's quite uh, fundamental. Um, and of course, the, the, one of the sticky points is the, how to accelerate financing solutions, and it's all in blended finance, so how to mobilize private sector, unlock private finance uh, there. And we are working a lot on that at the OECD, by the way. And, and this idea of, uh, as I said, uh, uh, ecosystem innovation, so I think this is uh, super interesting to me what you said, and and to have embedded into these solutions all the aspect, the social aspects, and the social innovation that goes with that, because it's 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 not only technology. We tend to focus on technology, but it's a whole ecosystem innovation that needs to happen, uh, that is quite e e important. And and one uh, one other point that you mentioned is like we need to 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 use, and probably we don't use do it enough to use the fact that uh, the counterfactual, I mean, if we don't do it, what will happen and what is already happening? And, you know, I come from Britain in France. This night we had a big uh, storm, 180 kilometers of winds, which is super rare. We didn't have that for the last 20 years. So, I mean, this is happening already. And we need to use this argument much more, I think, in to, to, to unlock, you know, the investment. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of an obvious proposition to invest in that. So that would be the, the main point I would uh, get from the Thanks. I mean, it is a, it's a super interesting topic because it's what's all around us. Even, Kirsten, as you were mentioning, the Hofburg Palace. I mean, this is still part of the built environment and the things that are driving emissions, whether it be the old buildings, new buildings. There's all kinds of different solutions that need to be found and all different types of solutions that are being developed. We've heard about a lot of them here today. So I want to thank the panelists for some really interesting innovations, interventions. How about some uh, a round of applause for them? <laughs>